Okay, everybody. Um, uh, I'd just like to start, first of all, by um, uh, welcoming Birkbeck students, Birkbeck alumni, and I think we can say uh, friends of Birkbeck uh, Sport Management, and also and our, our, our esteemed panel. My, I, I, as you all know me. I'm Sean Hamill. I'm director of the sport management programs here in Birkbeck. And I'd just like to start, first of all, by, um, for the benefit of our, our guests, really, just saying a little bit about the college. I mean, I, I just came from, I suppose, what you would call the State of the Nation Address by the Master of Birkbeck, Professor David Latchman. And one of the points he was t talking about, that Birkbeck's now 190 years old as an institution. I mean, it's been here a long time, and I think one of the reasons is that it's evolved uh, in terms of its offer and, you know, tried to... Uh, meet its core mission, which is uh, the uh, the needs of working people in London. But obviously, that mission has expanded over time. We now have uh, a very, very substantial full-time postgraduate uh, school, of which the the various the, the portfolio sport management programs are a key part. And we we've just about to graduate our our first cohort of full-time undergraduates. Um, and we've also got a very, very significant international student body. And I mean, it was very, it was, it was very pleasing actually to listen to the master because in fact the college is in very rude health, uh, although I'm not seeing any of it, so, but never mind, it was a good thing. Um, now, so that's the background of Birkbeck. It's uh, originally we were set up to provide education for working people in the evening, uh, skilled workers. Um, now, what I'd like to do, first of all, is extend a welcome to Paul, Amy, Paul and Will. Thanks for coming along tonight. Uh, Form the panel for what's going to be a, a very, very interesting debate. Um, just regarding yourselves, I mean, the program, I think we're now in the 13th year of our programs, and from very small beginnings, you know, they've grown to be very, very substantial. And one of the things we've always done is um, we've, we'd like to think we're running the, the, you know, one of the leading sport management programs in the country, but also in parallel with that, we've always been research led. Um, you only have to go onto the website that we have now to see the sort of range of research activity. All of you know about my very uh, good relationship with Professor Stefan Zemanski and, if you, uh, and, and the various arguments we had about sport economics over the year. And if you want to see it a little bit more, you can go into the House of Commons Culture and Media Sport Committee website and see the two of us arguing about it in, in front of various MPs. And that kind of... Um, sort of a commitment to sort of quality research feeding into teaching has been at the heart of what we want to be about. And I think that over time, one of the reasons why we have uh, been able to expand our recruitment is a lot of the recruitment has come through word of mouth. And an awful lot of our graduates have gone into quite good positions within the sport field. And we're very, very encouraged by that. We've had a number of football club directors, for example, over the years. We have people who are working at FIFA now, um, I just got emailed earlier in the year by uh, a graduate from last year who just started working at Zenith St. Peter Petersburg, and that's all very pleasing. But I think that it would be fair to say, and we don't really do self-criticism, but perhaps we haven't been that scientific about what happens after people graduate. And as a group, the sport management team really came to the conclusion that the time had come when that had to end. And we had to start thinking in a more structured way, A, how we can facilitate uh, our, current, our current students moving into work in the sector and to continuing to support those of, of our graduates who are still looking to move into the sector to, to get, to, get to, to the positions that they want. And I think more importantly, to take advantage of this very, very strong and growing alumni who are working in the field, to form a networking group for which you can all use to your advantage to further your careers in the sector. And I think tonight really is, in a way, it's, 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 a, it's a first step. I, years ago, I interviewed a CEO of a very prominent football club that was then on the stock market, and he's a very, very successful guy. And one of the, when he was talking in the context of broadband at the time, and he said, well, you know, how are we going to expand our media uh, footprint? He said, well, we can only move forward at the pace of reality. He was talking about the, the rolling out of the, you know, the broadband footprint. And I thought that, that that was something that stuck in my mind. And I would like to think that in our own situation, that that has been one of the things that hindered us, that for quite some time, perhaps we didn't really have the resource necessary for us to really put the foot to the pedal in this initiative. But I think that we've now reached the point where that, that can change. 
And I think one of the things I would really like to see to come out of tonight, let's not, let's not make any wild promises about we will, what we will or will not do, but I would like to think that this would be the start of a properly structured, very active alum, uh, sports management alumni association for Birkbeck people uh, going forward. Now, one of the very practical initiatives that we took in order to make that structured approach a reality was we, 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 we've been partnering now for two years with I mean, what is the number one sports recruitment uh, website company, Global Sports Jobs. I know Will Lloyd well over a number of years. They're very, very innovative, and it's, it's an absolute pleasure to be working with Will and, and his colleagues from Global Sports Jobs. And as you all know, we have a special page on the website where you can go directly into Global Sports Jobs website where they have all the latest vacancies and increasingly a lot of internships. So I'll stop there, unusually for me, as you know that normally I never say one word where 20 will do, but we do have a strict uh, a timetable tonight. And I'd just like to thank you all for coming along. Hopefully this is going to be the start of something that's going to add a lot of value for everybody, for the college, for you guys, and I think particularly for recruiters in, 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 the, in the sector. You know, those of us in the team, myself, Jeff Walters, Rich Taken, etc. We know we have really, really good people because it's a pleasure to teach you and to keep in touch with me. And what we want is we want that message getting out into the wider sports management community in a much more, much louder, very courteous, but much louder way. So thank you very much and over to Will. Thank you, Sean. And uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the first in a series of sports HR, HR seminars. Can you hear me at the back? Is it all, all good? Good. Well, it's great to see so many people here. I think probably 20 years ago, uh, given the topic of sport and HR, we probably would have had nobody attending. I think 10 years ago, we might have probably just had an audience that broke into double figures. But here, it's good to see that there's at least um, sort of 80, 90, 100 people here tonight. So uh, good to see you all, and thank you very much for, for making the effort. Um, I think this audience is a statement of the growing importance and realization uh, that people are at the very heart of our business. And to coin a well-known phrase, um, an organization is only as good as the people that it employs. So it's good to talk about uh, people, it's good to talk about human resources and people, and it's particularly good to talk about people, human resources and the sports industry. Um, I'm very excited to have uh, the first Birkbeck seminar, three very knowledgeable speakers, all of whom know a lot about people. They know how to attract them, they know how to develop them, they know how to manage them, and they know how to retain them. So I would like to introduce you to Paul Kennedy, who is the Human Resource Director of Café Nero, formerly of New Balance. Uh, he's licking his wounds this evening because he was uh, up in Manchester City, City uh, Stadium yesterday and doesn't want to talk about what happened. Um, but Paul has been instrumental in the growth of New Balance uh, as a brand, uh, as an employment brand, uh, and also took New Balance into the Commonwealth Games uh, in 2010 as recognition of, of what New Balance were doing and how they were doing it. Um, to Paul's right, we have Amy Wyatt, Recruitment Manager at Sky TV, or B Sky B. Um, Amy has had a lot of experience in not only recruitment within media, but also in the sports industry and also the re recruitment world, oh, sorry, the corporate world. So very experienced in understanding how to build um, talent pipelines to build employment brands and to attract the right talent. To Amy's right, we have Paul Modley, Director of Talent, or Director of talent Collective, a, a consultancy specialising in talent acquisition and formerly the Head of Recruitment for London 2012. So uh, three fantastic panellists. I'm sure we're going to learn a lot from them this evening and I'd like you all to welcome them here today. Whilst I have the stage, and, it's, uh, and we haven't gone too far into this evening's uh, proceedings, I'd just like to firstly 
thank, a big thank you to Bert Beck for hosting this evening. Uh, I think we've got some fantastic speakers, and I hope that we'll have a lively audience that will stimulate uh, some excellent discussion. Um, if you have any questions, please just stick your hand up, and we can uh, make sure they get answered as quickly as possible. I'm quite keen that it's as interactive as it possibly can be. Um, to keep up with social trends, we actually are live streaming tonight's event. Miss that one. Uh, so live streaming the event at the following address. Um, so we will have an audience, or we do have an audience, uh, that is outside of, of this room. Um, and if they are interested in uh, having any questions, then they can actually Twitter or tweet us at hashtag SportsHR series. Um, I'd like as much tweeting to go on as possible about the event and about the content that is discussed. So again, uh, hashtag SportsHR series is the, um, is the hashtag that, we, that we're using, or the tweet that we're using. Um, after the event, globalsportsjobs.tv will also be hosting the, uh, the recorded session. So you can watch it again, or you can learn, uh, you can take parts from it on globalsportsjobs.tv. TV. Uh, the final thing I, I just want to say this evening uh, before I hand over to Paul is that when I founded Global Sports Jobs three years ago, uh, I did so on the basis of three key values. Innovation, education, and inspiration. Today, I'd like to think that we have encompassed all three of these values in what we will, in what we will be showcasing here. Innovation, to the best of my knowledge, this is the first ever HR sports series, seminars. From an education perspective, I would like to think that we will all learn something tonight and we'll all take something away that we can use further down the line. Thirdly, and possibly the most important to me tonight, is that we inspire. We inspire some of the audience to consider a career in the sports industry and potentially inspire all of us in the way that we look at HR in sport but also in business generally. Without further ado, I'd like to welcome Paul onto the stage and uh, allow him to share some of his thoughts on this topic. Okay, can you hear me at the back? Excellent. Evening, everybody. Oh, come on, you can do better than that. Evening, everybody. Evening. That's better, just to prove that you're all awake. First of all, first question before I get on with the, uh, the few slides I've got. Are there any Manchester City fans in the audience? <laughs> it's a very important question. Put your hand up if there are. No? Okay. Anybody here from New Zealand? <laughs> Being part Irish is a very important question as well. Anybody here from Chile or Germany? <laughs> oh, we've got one or two. Okay. Anybody here from Australia? Okay, so we've had a really bad week in the world of <laughs> sports in the United Kingdom. A really bad week. Couldn't get any worse, really, could it? Yeah, and I was at uh, Wembley on Saturday watching uh, England play uh, New Zealand in that rugby league uh, World Cup semi-final, 20 seconds away from a World Cup final. 20 seconds away. How did I feel? Gutted. Yeah, how did I feel on Sunday? Just disappointed. <laughs> really bad. Anyway, uh, enough about uh, my lovely um, sporting habits. I travel the world watching sports and uh, get involved in sport everywhere. Um, a little bit about me, first of all, and a little bit about what um, I'll be talking to you about in the next kind of 20 minutes. First of all, I'm going to talk just a little bit about me. Uh, a little bit about my background. Uh, I'm going to be talking to you a little bit about some of the uh, technology um, traits that we see going on in business at the moment, and in particular in Cafe Nero, um, and some of the ambitions that we have in Cafe Nero and why technology is so important for us. I'm also going to be talking about some of the trends in the world of HR and some of the trends in relation to what we're seeing in Cafe Nero in the world of HR. And then also, um, finally, uh, talk to you about some of the linkages between the world of sports and the world of human resources, and particularly how it pertains in the world of Cafe Nero as well. And then at the end, you know, 
I'm all done and dusted with my colleagues here on the panel. And there's any open questions, feel, uh, please feel free to ask me. Or later on, uh, after the event, please feel free to come and find me. So, a little bit about me. I've been in, uh, in business for uh, far longer than I tend to kind of remember, really. 30 years or so. Uh, and I started uh, my business life back in 1983, thereabouts. And I, uh, I took up a job in a sports centre. Okay, in a sports centre. Uh, a local sports facility as a sports attendant working 10 hours a day. That was my first job. Don't let anyone ever tell you that there's such a th bad thing as a first job. There's no such thing as a bad first job. And I still remember those days in the first you know, kind of 100 days, you know, first year of my employment uh, with such gratitude really because I learned so much. You know, I learned so much about how to deal with people, and about how to talk to people, and I built confidence for my very first job. But I was lucky, because I came across my first job in the sports sector. And I spent some 13 years in local government. Local government in the London Borough of Enfield, working for leisure services. And I built myself up, actually. I just loved what I did. I absolutely had a passion for working in sport. So I would put all the hours in, it doesn't matter whether I get paid or not, I just put all the hours in, working in sport and recreation, you know, kind of putting on courses for kids, uh, spending my weekends at a sports centre, making people know that I was there, making people know that I was willing to put the extra hours in, put the extra work in. And I progressed from a sports attendant to a lovely opportunity, uh, which opened up as a duty manager at a, a sports centre with a swimming pool. They called it a wet side uh, facility. And I had that opportunity, or I had a couple of other jobs to choose from. One was a, a duty manager at a swimming pool, one was a sports attendant at Crystal Palace National Sports Centre, where I've been doing some work experience, and one was a sports officer at a sports centre where I've been. And I chose the duty manager uh, position. Um, I, offered them, I got offered them all, believe it or not, but a duty manager position at a wet side facility. And I became the first person in the, in the whole of London to work in a leisure facility with a swimming pool when you couldn't even swim. I couldn't swim, <laughs> right? So when you're looking at jobs that are out there, and when you're looking at opportunities that come up, don't necessarily go for the easy one. Go for the hard one. That was a really hard one for me. I couldn't swim. And yet I was there managing a leisure facility with a swimming pool. And so the story went on. And uh, I got a job um, from a leisure facility with this lovely swimming pool at Southgate Leisure Centre. Landed a great job, Edmonton Green Leisure Centre, uh, which is a very prestigious leisure centre uh, out in London Borough of Enfield. And then rapidly went through the ranks and became a contracts manager for London Borough of Enfield Leisure Services. And contracts manager, just to put it in perspective, was actually handling the London Borough of Enfield contracts uh, for all the sports and leisure facilities this is back in 1990, when Margaret Thatcher was tendering out all of the leisure facilities for, for private sector competition. So, roll on the years, quite interesting. Opportunity opens up, contracts manager, we had to set ourselves up as an organisation. Here I was, two of my colleagues who I still know very well today, you know, also were working with me at the time. We had three disciplines to set up, human resources, marketing, finance. And we literally sat around the table one day and said, who wants to do what? And I put my hand up and said, human resources. And subsequently went out and got myself qualified in the world of human resources. I you know, got my professional qualifications in my own time, put my own effort in, and became the person who was responsible for human resources. So my HR career really only started in 1991-92. And then bizarrely in 1996, 13 years after being in local government, an opportunity came up to join a lovely company called Rosenbluth International. And Rosenbluth International today is part of American Express Travel. So back in 2004, American Express bought out Rosenbluth International. And I can tell you a beautiful story about Rosenbluth International because my wife works for Rosenbluth International. And my wife got me the job at Rosenbluth International. My wife was responsible for me being here today. And that's a true story. She, um, she opened up the door for me, 
uh, managed to get me in front of a managing director and I secured this lovely job in Rosenbluth. Another true story about Rosenbluth, at a time when I joined, we have 58 people based here in London. 58 people. By the time we got to uh, 2000 and, uh, 2019, 99, we had something like 1,000 people based across Europe. I'd never been on a plane before. I spent 300 days in the space of two years out on a plane visiting various locations around the world. And I still have some great friends from my time in Rosenbluth because it was that type of company. It's a great company and was a great company. It still is, although it's part of American Express travel now. And the events of 2001, September the 11th, 2001, those tragic events when the planes hit the uh, Twin Towers decimated the travel industry. And it actually decimated Rosenbluth International as well. So in the time that I spent in the first five years setting up the company, the next two years in Europe was actually about taking that company apart and restructuring it. And a lot of the people who left the company in 2003 are still very good friends of mine. A lot of the people who I had to deal with in terms of their exit from the company. So an important lesson for me in that time was treat the people well when you're going up the ladder, because when you're coming down the ladder, you know you might need them in the future. And these guys, as I said, are still great friends of mine, and we help each other out. You know, we often uh, collaborate together, talk about opportunities, and help each other along the way. I then went off to uh, ebookers.com. How many of you know ebookers? Yeah? So ebookers, leading age technology company. I was there for two years. Two years seemed like 10 years. It was fast, it was furious, uh, it was a technology-based company where decisions had to be made in real time. You know, if, you if your um, website was down for 30 seconds, you're losing literally a million pounds. That's how much it costs, 30 seconds down on the website, a million pounds. So just think about that, you know, a million pound lost opportunity. And so the, the way we ma managed and handled our human resources was you know, unbelievably relentless. You know, knowledge was key, technology was key to us being successful uh, in the future. And eBookers was sold in 2005, soon after uh, I left the company. And I left the company because I came back to something that I love, which is sports, a new balance. A new balance, I was there for uh, seven years, seven and a half years. Uh, lovely company, how many of you know New Balance? Okay, that's good. Yeah, you all know it now. New Balance, running shoe company, uh, family-owned company, around for 100 years, make some great running shoes, headquartered in Boston, USA, the uh, European headquarters was in Warrington, up in Manchester. You know, we had a fabulous time building a company and putting a company on the map. How many of you know Warrior Sports? Okay, Warrior Sports, they sponsor Liverpool Football Club. They're part of a New Balance family of brands. Okay, look it up, Warrior Sports. It's the biggest uh, growing sports um, team company and brand out there at this moment in time. And then I managed to get myself through seven glorious years in New Balance and ended up at the wonderful Cafe Nero. So there I am in a head office over in Warrington for New, Bal for New Balance and now I'm in head office in Covent Garden in Cafe Nero. And I think I've got the best job in the world. And I don't think anyone can beat me. And let me tell you why. Because in Cafe Nero, our model is quite simple. Right? Our vision as a company in Cafe Nero is to have the world's best coffee company. And when I say the world's best coffee company, it's the world's best coffee company and the world's best coffee company in any market that we do business in. And a market can be a country, it can be a local market, it can be London, it can be the northeast of England. Wherever we trade, we want to be known as the world's best coffee company. And to be the world's best co coffee company, quite simply, you need great people. You need people's strength throughout the organisation. And what's going to signify the world's best coffee company? The product in terms of coffee, having the world's best coffee the best financial returns, 
making sure we got a, a good return on investment and having the very best people that we can get in the marketplace. And so how do you go after getting the very best people? Well, in the world of human resources, it's very simple. It's a very simple model and very effective. We split it down into three component parts, resourcing, development, and retention. So resourcing is key. How do we identify the talent that's going to come through and help us as we grow our company for the future? And how do we de develop that talent to help us take a leadership role in our marketplace in the future? Then how do we retain that talent long term? And those are the three components that we work with in the world of Café Nero. And why is this so important? Café Nero, at this moment, we're in seven countries. How many of you knew we were in seven countries throughout the world? There you go, we're in seven countries. We have 535 stores here in the United Kingdom. We're also in Cyprus, we're in Turkey, we're in Poland, we're in the UAE, we're in Dublin, over in Southern Ireland, and we're in Boston, USA. So we are growing as a company. We are growing at a rate of about 70 stores a year across the globe. And so when we're growing so rapidly, we need to have a talent pool of people coming through our organization that can help us grow and flourish for the future. That's why it's so important to make sure we've got great people on board. And as a company is changing and evolving and moving in the way that it's moving, it's really important that we integrate people into the company in the right way. So that's why our culture as a company needs to be protected and enhanced in the future as well. And also you see at the bottom here a little bit about HR information, technology. Technology is driving a lot of things in our company at this moment in time. I'll come to that in a moment. As is best practice. Uh, it's always the best way of doing something. Uh, there might be 100 people in this audience who would approach things in a different way, but one of you would have the best way. So choose and adopt the best way is a philosophy that we've adopted in Café Nero. Why is technology so important for us? Well, the landscape is changing. Uh, the people who we want to attract to the world of Café Nero, they're, they're attracted in a different way. You need to engage with them in a very innovative and creative manner. We need to reach out to them in a very innovative and creative manner. The world is changing. And these stats are quite interesting. Look at these stats up here. This is the world of social media. And a lot of our folks who come and join us in the world of Café Nero come through one of these means. They contact us or we contact them or they connect with us through one of these social media sites. And if you wanted to reshape the world at this moment in time, put a new map on the world, you probably have China as a, a leading country with a, the most people. You probably have India, second leading country. Then you'd have Facebook as a third leading country because the world is changing. And so as Cafe Nero, we have to change as well to adapt and adopt a new way of thinking and adapt and adopt yeah, a way of attracting and engaging the people out there that we need for the future. And you'll find over the next 18 months or so that Café Nero will appear on a lot of these social media sites. Right, with very strong employer branding coming to fruition. Let's flick. And the reason why we're going to appear a lot of these... Uh, social media sites this is what you see up here. There's multiple strands in relation to our, our approach to technology in Nero at this moment in time. We've got a massive infrastructure development program taking place. And let me tell you how that looks. When I joined the company two years ago, I sat in my office over in Covent Garden and there was this little machine out in the main office which was churning out bits of paper, bits of paper, bits of paper. And I couldn't get my head around it for a couple of days. What on earth was all this paper doing coming out of the machine, landing all over the floor? And then I realized it was a fax machine. Uh, it was a fax machine churning out all this paper all over the floor. And every single one of our stores up and down the country had a fax. 
and they were faxing things through to our HR department bit by bit by bit. So 500 stores sending faxes morning, noon and night meant that we were ballooning with paper. So that's issue number one. Eliminate the paper. You have to eliminate paper. Get it all online. Much more efficient and effective way of doing business. Issue number two, the way we operate as a company, right, people come to us with a bit of technology savvy, a bit of a technology brain. So we want people to engage with us while they're in the world of Cafe Nero, with the world of technology. So we are deploying into our stores up and down the country uh, technology platforms which allow people to engage with us in a different way, which allow people to go online and talk to us, allows people to share their experiences. Just as you do in the sporting world, you share your experiences. We're part of one big family and one big team. We want people to share their experiences around the company. Issue number three, simple things you never really think of, you know, our tills that we have, where we take the money, yeah? I mean, 535 tills. It would be good to network them all up so we can have real-time information that we can look at and make real-time decisions on. So all of that is happening at breakneck speed in the world of Nero at this moment in time. The digital engagement, we've just seen a little bit about digital platforms and social media platforms, about why it's so important to make sure that we have a sophisticated system that goes out there and engages with communities in the world of Cafe Nero. And our employer branding, you, know, you will see, and if you go online, if you go onto our careers page at this moment in time on our website, you'll see a little bit about the branding. You'll see a little bit about the communication and the messaging that goes out to try and attract people to come and join us. To try and attract people in at the grassroots of our company. And I also have a very simple mantra in our organization. Right? Standardize the work we do, simplify the work we do, look to automate it, and then look to optimize our human resources, our people around in the organization. It's the same in any sports team, it's the same in any environment that you operate in. Look to make it as simple and as easy as possible and then de deploy your best people on the work that needs to be done. One of the trends, you know, there's a few trends that we've seen in the world of Nero and in the world of coffee generally and in the world of, um, uh, in the world of customer service. Right? Yeah, we have a very strong ambition of being the world's best coffee company. And to be the world's best coffee company, as I said earlier, we need to have the world's best people. And who employs the world's best people? It's our HR community. It's a team that we have in place in the world of HR. They're guardians around recruitment and development and retention of our people. So it's really important that we have the best team in place in terms of HR professionals. And it's really important that I know that when we've got people out there working on behalf of the world of Cafe Nero, that they're representing the company in the best possible way. So it's the same in the world of sport. Yeah, if you don't have the best team, you're not going to win the game, the match, or the league. Same in the world of Cafe Nero and business. If you don't have the best team, you're not going to be in a position to realize your vision and your ambition at the end of the day. And it starts with the world of human resources. So for the last 18 months, I've been out recruiting some very, very, very talented people to be part of the team in terms of HR and training in the world of Nero. And we're still recruiting. The reason that we need to recruit as well is we need to grow our own talent. It's a really important one. For a company that's growing so quickly, we need to get people in at the grassroots of the company and then grow that talent through the company. Fundamentally important. Right? Because a company like Nero, it's the same as any sports team, you get the wrong people in, it disjoints the team, disjoints the company. And it's a very costly exercise. Right? You get the right people in and you're away and running for the future. So we need to have very, very good programs and very, very good people who can deliver those programs in terms of educating and developing people to realize our future ambitions. 
And one of the other things about uh, a trend that we see more and more in the world of HR generally, but certainly in the, in the coffee industry, is that because things are moving so rapidly, uh, it's very, very easy to lose sight of what's really important in your company. And the one fundamental thing that's really important is the culture of your company. So as you're, as you're driving change through your company, and as you're evolving and challenging the norm and innovating and doing all the great things, the one thing you've got to protect, the one thing you've got to protect is the culture of your company. Because if you don't protect it and you ruin it, you don't have a company for the future. Same again in any sports team, any sports environment, exactly the same. If you destroy your culture, you destroy your company. I'll give you an idea about how many people we're employing at the moment. Don't let people tell you that the economy's bad, right? Because we are employing a lot of people. This year alone, we're going to be employing around about 1,500 people in the world of Nero, maybe a few more, uh, actually, in, in terms of some of the new store openings we've got. So that's, uh, well, actually, it's 1,800 people, sorry, 1,800 people. 1,800 people is a lot of people to come and join the world of Nero. 1,800 people is a lot of people to try and find out there in this maze of a world where people are confused about what they want to do or what careers they want to have. 1,800 people is a lot of people to go and access and bring through into a lovely family of Cafe Nero. So hence why our human resources department has to be a top-notch department to go and find these great people for the future. And give you some idea as well, that 2013 and 14 turnover number, that's the amount of people, uh, the amount of people who are leaving our company in the space of 12 months. 12 months ago, that number was north of 100%. So 100% of our people are leaving within 12 months. Unbelievable. We're going to be at 50% as we go through this year, and our ambition is to get down to 30% or below. And we're at 30% or below, I'll be pretty satisfied that we're on the right, uh, the right kind of trajectory to become known as one of the best employers out there in the coffee industry. And this one's interesting as well. It shows you a little bit about um, you know, the kind of store managers that we need. This is our leadership portfolio uh, for the future. And this tells you a little bit about um, some of the ambitions we have as well in terms of growing our own talents in particular and how important it is to seed people into the company and then nurture them and grow them for the future. You'll see here one of the interesting pieces down below. Yeah, 80% of our store managers and 80% of our area managers and 80% of our regional managers and 80% of our leaders are internal promotions. 80% right, are internal promotions. So what we try and give people is an opportunity to develop their careers and enhance their reputations in the world of Nero. And what we try and give people is an opportunity to grow and develop and flourish. Just the same you would do in a sports environment or just the same you would do in a team environment as well. And then just a little note about some sport and business comparisons. Interesting little note. Most sports teams play to win. Don't they? They don't just turn up and lose, not like Spurs did yesterday, but they play to win. Yeah. Businesses play to win as well. They just play to win in a different way. Winning for business is about making money. It's about satisfying shareholders' interests. It's about, more than anything else, satisfying the customers' interests. And actually, beyond all of that, beyond anything else, it's about satisfying, developing, and growing your people. But at the end of the day, if you don't have people as part of your business and you're not able to satisfy them, you don't have a business. Simple as that. Okay, so they play to win in a different way. Just the results are different to a normal team playing on a Saturday afternoon. An elite sport performance is about improving the fine margins. If you think about a rugby game on Saturday, the fine margins, you know, 20 seconds to go, the one missed tackle and they've lost the game, yeah? But elite business performance is about staying ahead of the pack and making sure you realize your vision at the end of the day. 
don't take your eye off where you want to go. Don't take your eye about off what's really important in terms of your culture as a company. Stay the pace, keep focused on what you're trying to achieve for the future. More than anything, sport and business are about having the right people in the right place at the right time. And that is so true of any type of sporting environment I've come across and any type of business environment. If you don't have the right people in the right place, you don't have a team and you don't have a business. So taking the time to find the right people and taking the time to employ those people is key to your success in the future. And finally, maximizing your human capital is so obvious. Actually, it's nothing more than treating your people in the way that they want to be treated, in a way that's going to be galvanizing and encouraging for them, a way that's going to be innovating for them, challenging for them, and developing for them. I think that's it. I'd just like to say uh, one last thing, and that is, uh, you know, as you walk through this evening and all the presentations and what have you, please feel free to ask any questions at the end uh, of anything that uh, you know, brought up as a topic of conversation, or even afterwards, if you want to grab me for five minutes and talk to me about anything that you see that might be of interest to you on the slides, please feel free to, uh, uh, to come and find me. Or later on, if you just want to drop me an email as well, happy to answer any questions you've got. Thank you very much. Hi, everybody. Um, just while Will brings up my shorter presentation, I wanted to try and start this with um, a, uh, a video we have of David Beckham, but it wasn't really relevant, so um, <laughs> I haven't been able to sort of uh, get that in here. So um, I'm the recruitment manager for content at Sky. So what we um, mean by that is I'm responsible for all the recruitment we do at Sky um, within Sky Sports, Sky News, Sky Sports News, um, our entertainment channels um, as well, and also Sky Production Services, which is our studios and all our edit suites as well. So um, while we can say that you know, there is that sports element, essentially Sky is, is a media company. However, we um, clearly have a, a huge sports focus. So I've been at Sky for about, um, well, just over a year now. Um, and I've joined the team at a time that is um, where it's going through a, a major transformation. Um, the recruitment team historically at Sky was very much um, a, a team of people who would manage the supply chain of recruitment agencies, bringing people into the, um, into the uh, business. Um, we wanted to change that, and the model has changed from one which is... Um, a, um, a direct sourcing strategy um, and that's the reason I came in. Um, my, my background is actually I started out as a, um, as a recruitment consultant um, working on the agency side of, um, of recruitment. Um, I, I didn't really know what it was to be perfectly honest with you when I first started out um, 15 years ago um, and I started working for a small recruitment agent, uh, a, a relatively um, well, small to medium sized recruitment agency um, and um, Times were great. Um, the recruitment industry at the time was a very, very different landscape from what it is um, today. Um, at the time, um, recruitment agencies were incredibly valuable because of the database of talent that they held. And it was really the only way that organizations were able to tap into external talent. That or by putting out a, an advert with a, um, you know, in a newspaper, wasn't even the, you know, there wasn't even the internet at the time. So it was um, lucrative times, um, it was happy times, as you worked in, if you worked in recruitment in those days, oh for those days, they are long gone. Um, and then I, um, I took the opportunity to actually go and, um, and work in New York. Um, I thought at the time it would be um, a really, it would be really, really good for my CV to get some international experience. Um, and to go and experience um, recruiting in, in another country. So I went out to New York and, um, well, ironically, that experience is almost 
redundant now. Um, the recruitment landscape has changed so much that it's easy for anybody to be an international recruiter that you don't actually need to physically move to that country in order to do it. And you'll find that um, the way that we recruit here in the UK is very similar to how it's done in the States now, or indeed in, you know, in Asia or in Europe. Um, we, all have the same, um, we all have access to the same technologies um, and the same ways of finding candidates. Um, so while I had a fantastic time for two years in New York, and it was very good for my own, um, my own personal development, um, it, from, a, from a career point of view, it was probably, um, uh, it, it's not experience that I, I need to necessarily draw on. Um, when I came back to the UK, that's where I really saw that the um, recruitment landscape was changing. You saw the advent of job boards like Monster beginning to um, come, into, come into play. Um, and it meant that um, talent was accessible to more and more people. You saw that recruitment agencies who were being successful in that time were the ones who were specialising. They had a particular niche in which they, um, they specialised. Um, and so I, um, I decided that I should probably do that and um, I should specialise in something. So I specialised a little bit in the public sector, but then um, I moved to um, a recruitment firm that specialised in the sports industry. Um, and at the time, that's how, how I met Will. Um, at the time, it was quite interesting because it was really the only, um, it was the only recruitment agency at the time that were really, was really looking at the business of sport and the talent within it and looking at ways in which we could potentially draw talent from other industries and other areas into the sport industry. Um, I think we would probably all agree at the time um, some of the people within the industry were, um, you know, were, but there was a lot of um, ex-players, ex-athletes, it was very much based on who you knew, not, um, not, not necessarily what you knew and um, we worked very hard to try and bring a different skill base into the, into the industry. Um, and then from there, um, I, 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 I moved on to work for um, a recruitment outsourcing firm and, um, and then latterly um, joined Sky. Um, I think what has been the, one of the most interesting things that I've seen that has changed is just simply the way that we do recruitment. Five years ago, maybe even ten years ago, internal recruitment teams um, were in some organisations non-existent um, and those that did exist were simply there to manage the supply chain of recruitment agencies that supplied talent in, in, internally. That has changed completely now um, and the reason that I've been brought in to, I was brought into Sky and the other, my other colleagues were as well is because we have the ability to directly source talent. Um, we are experienced recruiters, we're not administrators, we, um, a lot of us have a background in headhunting um, and we are there to um, actively find the best talent for Sky using lots and lots of different technologies out there. So, um, moving on a little bit more to how we, how we actually do that at, um, at Sky and, you know, and, and how we attract our talent. Um, sorry, that's this slide, Will, that's fine, thanks. <laughs> uh, no, 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 the next one. There you go back, go back. that's it, thanks. So, um, I've kind of tried to do this in a little bit of a pyramid way. Um, we have a fantastic brand. We're so lucky with our brand and especially within the content world. If you want to work in um, production in sport, then you think Sky. So we are able to attract a huge amount of people just through our own brand. Um, and we will use our own, we use our website, um, um, workforsky.com, check it out, and um, to, to, to attract a lot of people into the business. Um, where, we, um, where we need to expand um, our search, then we will use the social media channels such as LinkedIn, Twitter, YouTube and Facebook. We have got the, the multi-channel social recruiting that we do is absolutely enormous. The amount of talent that we have access to through those channels is, is huge. So, for example, with um, Twitter recently, within, um, within Sky News, when we've been looking for um, a particular journalist, um, or looking for a, um, a particular correspondent, what we'll actually do is get the um, correspondents within Sky News to tweet that, that that's what we're, you know, we're looking for, and then the word spreads through their own networks, and then we're able to tap into all of that talent. 
and in the same way we do, um, we do similar things through LinkedIn. So while the, um, the, the old boy network that used to exist within, um, within the industry um, it is still there, we're actually trying to use that a lot more intelligently now um, and in, in a way that we can, um, we can put into place also, as a, we also put into place proper recruitment processes around that. If we can't recruit people through those channels, then we will um, look at um, some of the specialist job boards that are out there as well. Interestingly, it's so rare that we would ever really use a job board like Monster now. Um, it's got so big and it's just um, it, the, the, the talent that is there um, is, is so vast that actually we're able to, you know, to do better, more targeted searches through something like LinkedIn. Um, but we, um, we do tap into some of the um, more specialist job boards and with um, diversity being such a key um, part of our agenda as well, um, we want to make sure that we are attracting the most diverse talent to, to the business. So technology has really, really changed the um, landscape for us as well um, and we, you know, we, we, we obviously um, use it on a, on a daily basis. So some of the trends that um, I've really noticed in the... Um, in, in the sort of recruitment landscape within the industry is that um, we have a really robust and sophisticated recruitment process which is very much based on skill set. Um, it is no longer about who you know, it is absolutely about the skills that you can offer and it is about um, matching those skills to the specific roles that we have. Um, we, have, um, we make sure that all of our um, interviews are competency based, they are matched very closely to if we're looking at recruiting senior level roles, then um, we, we set the interview around the leadership behaviours that are so important at Sky and also the Sky behaviours as well. So it all run, runs, um, you know, it's all a very um, well oiled, um, very sophisticated process. Um, interestingly, the CV is almost a tool which is becoming redundant. It's actually your online profile and how you're coming across online, which is what most recruiters internally will be looking at now. So what your LinkedIn profile looks like, you should put, if, if that's something that you haven't got right now, it's something that you really, really need to look into. Um, if you're a journalist, if you're a sports journalist, um, you know, the blogs you're writing online are probably going to say more about you than um, any CV would. Um, if you are a producer, then we often look at things like showreels, um, as opposed to um, looking at a, just a list of a, a CV. So um, your online profile is becoming more and more important, and very often we will um, bring people in and we'll begin to interview them um, on the basis of their LinkedIn profile alone and some of the recommendations that they may well have. Um, so it's an interesting way in which, it, in which things are moving. Um, We've seen a really massive surge in mobile. Um, there seems to be an app for absolutely everything at the moment. Um, people want to be able to um, access things on the go, wherever they're going. So um, the likes of LinkedIn have some amazing apps which you can download um, and keeps you in touch with some of the vacancies that are, um, that are, that are out there. Um, one of the things that's really, really important to us at Sky is to make sure that, and this is where um, the, um, the recruitment and HR teams work really, really closely together, um, is that we, um, we partner the business. We have to know what is going on within the business and what projects are coming up, and specifically within, um, within my area, what programs are going to be made, maybe what rights that we're going to be, um, that, that we might have, so that we can start pipelining the talent that we're going to need. Um, we want to be able to forecast as accurately as possible and we want to be able to ensure that we've got the best talent in place for when those things, um, those, when those things kick off. So we work really closely with the exec, we work really closely with the um, senior management team at Sky um, and we absolutely have a place at their table which historically is possibly not where you would see um, an ex-recruitment consultant. <laughs> but um, it's really important that we are... Um, that we're in, that we are partnering with them so that we're, um, you know, we're able to find out the, you know, find what talent they need. Um, diversity is, is key. It's so important for us to ensure that um, our workforce reflects our customer base um, and um, we work really, really hard to ensure that we are recruiting um, diverse talent within Sky. Um, 
One of the other things that's quite interesting as well, and this is where I was going to try and get in the David Beckham video, but um, is, is, is the Sky Academy. We've put into place much more structured programs recently for entry-level recruitment. So um, historically, the um, work experience programs or the, intern pro or the internships um, were really the reserve of maybe a director's nephew or someone's aunt, twice removed cousin. Um, they are now very, very structured programs within, um, within Sky, and that is everything from our apprenticeship programs through to our graduate programs through to work experience. And we have just recently launched the Sky Academy, which is all about getting young people into the media industry, giving them the opportunity to experience that, um, to, to get jobs within that industry um, that they might not necessarily have always had access to. So it's a really, really important part of um, the recruitment that we're, that we're going to be doing going forward. Um, some of the other trends that we, um, we're seeing as well is that it's simply the amount of data that is available to us. You can measure absolutely everything. You can measure time to hire. You can measure exactly where your people are coming from. Um, we use this um, to, to work out how successful we've been um, and you know, to really sort of drive our recruitment strategy as well. Um, and to touch on what um, Paul mentioned earlier, internal mobility is, um, is, is also really key. If we can promote internally, we will do. Um, and uh, interestingly, um, I've just been involved in the recruitment of the head of rights acquisitions within Sky Sports. Um, the girl who actually got that role previously worked within a finance team within Sky. So it's, you know, we are very much about moving people around and giving people the opportunity to work um, within um, different areas of the business. Um, just to touch a bit more on employer brand, um, this, we have a very, very specific, defined employer brand, um, and that is actually what ours is. It's changing the game, we deliver brilliantly, doing the right thing and in it together. Um, our employer brand is, um, is matched very, very closely to our own brand as well. Um, we want to make sure that um, you know, when we're engaging with um, talent out through various different social media, that people know exactly what it's like to work at Sky. They understand you know, what the, the culture's like, they understand what's expected, what the behaviours are. Um, so that when our recruiters or my team is going out and eventually trying to headhunt people, they should already know quite a lot about the organisation, what it's like to work there, and they're therefore much more engaged. So it's something that you'll see, you'll, you'll see um, companies um, concentrating a lot more on um, over, over the um, up, upcoming months. Um, so sport v business, business v sport, there's absolutely no doubt that sport has been central to Sky's success. Um, but it isn't, you know, it isn't the only story. And actually, um, the success that we've had in, um, in sport has um, really sort of driven a lot of the other areas of the business as well. So um, you've probably seen that we're doing a lot more within the entertainment space as well now, um, with some of the new dramas, etc., that are coming onto, onto Sky. Um, what we've worked quite hard to do as well is make sure that Sky Sports is integrated within to the, the, the bigger Sky picture. So using some of the expertise that we have within Sky Sports to help other areas of the business and vice versa as well. Um, we've wanted to make sure that um, Sky Sports is also benefiting from the expert of the wider Sky, Sky community. And we adopt the best practice. Um, we adopt the best practice from both. I think perhaps the best example that the best examples I can think of to give that is that um, we we obviously have um, uh, the, the Team Sky, the cycling team, um, and um, Dave Brailsford came to speak to our leadership team recently about about motivation, about you know sort of the winning formulas and getting teams to to work well. So we're using that connection to help drive our business. But likewise, in the Sky Sports Scholarship Program that we have, um, we, um, we sponsor um, uh, uh, promising athletes who, are, um, you know, who, who need financial support. And um, what we're able to do with, um, with them is not necessarily, is, is we can draw on some other areas of the business, such as our finance team, to help them budget going forward. So we're using that to, to help sport as well. Um, Another, another example being that um, we, the, the guy who is the head of Sky Sports Scholarships is um, a guy called Tony Lester. 
um, who is ex-UK Athletics. He trained a lot of the um, British Olympians. Um, and he has done some brilliant work going around the business, talking to different teams. And he actually came to talk to my team the other day about delivering world-class um, performance and what it takes to be world-class. And that sort of stuff is just really inspiring and really interesting for the business to hear. So we're using sport and the lessons from sport in that way to help drive our business and help to motivate our business too. So just some thoughts from me. Um, obviously, ask any questions going forward. I'll give you my email later as well if you want to send me your online profile too. <laughs> So I uh, get to pick the graveyard um, shift, so I will try and keep this um, fairly quick. So my name is Paul Modley. I uh, was head of recruitment at LOCOG, so we were the organising committee for the Olympic Games and Paralympic Games, and I was very lucky to get involved right at the outset. So I joined uh, at the beginning of 2007 when the, the organisation was about uh, six or seven months old, and I stayed right through to, uh, to 2012. Um, just briefly before that, I had a career in um, uh, sort of post-university, kind of dabbled in sort of sales and marketing for a bit, didn't really enjoy it, decided to go travelling uh, just for 12 months and ended up being away for six years. And um, I was in Sydney uh, when um, Sydney won the right to host the 2000 Olympics. And I remember being in the Opera House uh, at a really swanky event and thinking, my God, you know, the, the, the feel of the city when they won that was just incredible. Um, I kind of, kind of clocked that in the back of my head thinking, hmm, that sounds interesting, wouldn't mind getting involved in that sort of thing one day. Came back to, uh, came back to London, then got involved, uh, as you do, in recruitment, fell into recruitment like most recruiters do. Wasn't a real career choice, but worked for a headhunter um, for a bit. Uh, didn't really like head, well, I, I kind of liked headhunting for a bit, but then got bored of it and wanted to go in-house, wanted the, uh, I guess, intellectual challenge of working within a big corporate I chose banking um, for a variety of reasons. When banking was quite a good sort of industry to go in, they had a good brand, uh, good sort of career options. Uh, and I worked for Barclays. I went into Barclays um, in 2001 uh, and ended up staying there for about five years. Great organization at the time. Um, clearly has gone through quite a few challenges uh, since I left, not, uh, not when I was there. And I left Barclays um, and I thought, right, what do I do now? And it was when I was at Barclays, I was in Canary Wharf in one Churchill place, which is the Barclays Tower. And um, the Olympics guys had kind of moved in a few floors up. And I, thought, I kind of, I'd realized they were in the floor, but I kind of, you know, I didn't, uh, didn't really clock it. And I, was, I remember being in, a, in, a, in an interview on the ninth floor of Barclays Towers. I was interviewing somebody in risk, and it was a very, very dull. And it was the day that uh, the announcement was being made as to whether you know, London was going to host the, uh, the games. And I remember being in this interview, really, really vivid memory. This almighty roar went up across the building. I thought, oh my God, that must be, you know, London must have won the, uh, the right to bid, you know, to host the games. And at that moment, I said to myself, right, you know, I was there in Sydney when we won, and I kind of clocked it then. This is, this is my moment. This is my, my opportunity to try and get involved at some point. So, so I left Barclays not kind of knowing how I was going to get involved in the Olympics. Ended up going back into another banking role for six months. I thought, nah, this is really not what I want to be doing. Um, and I was lucky. You know, I guess you know, a lot of kind of career choices, it's about being in the right time, at the right place, you know, meeting the right people. I was very lucky to get introduced to the, um, the HR director uh, at LOCOG, a, a very inspiring lady called Jean Tomlin. Um, and, you know, it was a chance meeting, and she kind of said to me, look, I'm looking for some people, I need some help. You know, I've just joined you, I'm, you know, I've got this big organisation that I need to set up, and uh, why don't you come and just work for me for a couple of months? I thought, yeah, absolutely, why wouldn't I? And, you know, it was just one of those chance meetings, and from there it just... Um, Evolved, so it went from a three-month contract to a you know a long sort of six-year uh, job, which which was amazing. Um, so I started there, at the beginning of 2007, and uh, went right through to the end of 2012. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about uh, the challenges that uh, that we faced there. 
So let me just show you the, the unique thing about LOCOG is clearly it's a, it's a startup uh, organization and you kind of take it right through to, to dissolution. So there, let me just explain the, uh, the boxes. So there, there, are two, there were two main organizations in delivering the games. There, were, there was the Olympic Delivery Authority, which is the public body responsible for delivering the venues. So that's the, the, the pink boxes and, and clearly, you know, they, they, their, their workforce peaked uh, in um, you know, the, the end of 2011, early 2012, and they did a, an amazing job. LOCOG's sole responsibility or role really was to put on the game. So we were there responsible for putting on the, uh, putting on the show. Um, when I joined, we were a, walk, a workforce of about 80 people. Um, and you know, by the end of 2012, uh, we had a workforce of around about 200,000. So we had a permanent workforce of about 8,500 people. We had our volunteers, we had our amazing volunteers. Did anybody volunteer uh, in the games? Brilliant, you all did a fantastic job. Um, so we had around about 70,000 volunteers across uh, both games. Uh, and then we had around about 100,000 third party contractors. So they were the, the caterers, the cleaners, dare I say it, the security people that were, some were provided by G4S, but vast amounts were, uh, came through the, the armed forces. And again, they did an amazing job. Um, so all in all, around about 200,000 workforce. So kind of just think about that challenge. You know, when you're starting off, uh, we're about 80 people. And how, how do you effectively build an organization that has, that has to peak at around about 200,000? And then the day after the Paralympics finished, you know, the vast majority of those people had to move out and, and we had, then had to start closing the organization down. So it's a very, very, very unique um, um, entity. Well, sorry. <laughs> so I'll come back over this side because I can't read the slide. Um, so I'd, in terms of the, the trends, I, I've kind of gone off piste a little bit on this one. I, I really just want to talk about the role that HR plays in an organizing committee um, like uh, LOCOG. So the first challenge really is, you know, how do you put in place the, the normal things that HR departments do in terms of process, policy, governance, structure, payroll, training, recruitment. So you have to do all of that, but you have to do it in a really pragmatic way. Absolutely, you've got to make sure that people are paid and that they are you know, performance managed, etc. But you do it with a very pragmatic lens because you know that the organization is not going to be around forever. So you can't navel gaze. You can't spend months and months you know, with various committees looking at different processes around performance management and leadership development. You just don't have the time to do that. So for me, coming from a very corporate background, that was really refreshing because you, know, you just had to get on with it. You put, put processes in place. It didn't work. And you kind of went back and, uh, and refined them. Change management was really, really important. You know, we went from very much a corporate entity. So, so when I joined, we were in Swanky Barclays Towers, you know, and for three or four years, we were like any normal corporate. Um, and then we had to flip the organization um, on its side and move to a games operational entity where people moved out of Canary Wharf and then we kind of pushed them all into our games venue. So that was quite a challenge and obviously HR played an important role um, in that. I think we've heard about employee engagement in the previous um, presentations. Employee engagement was really, really important for us because of the, the change curve that we were going through. We needed to make sure that people really understood what they were doing, why they were coming on board. Uh, also recognizing that we had 70,000 volunteers coming on board right at the tail end that went through training, they went through selection, they went through training, but you know, we had to make sure that those people felt inspired, they felt motivated, they felt that they had the right training uh, to be able to get on and do what they needed. So that engagement uh, was critical. Life after 2012, particularly important for our permanent workforce. So again, you know, bearing in mind, we were recruiting people. We had no problems recruiting people, but we needed them to understand, actually, you're just here for a period of time. Once the games are finished, that's it. We don't need you. So that's a bit of a, a mind shift change that we needed people to, uh, to understand. So technology, um, very, very important and a you know, massive impact um, for us 
uh, in the OCOG. The, the one thing I would say about uh, the Olympics world is that um, the IOC is particularly conservative when it, when it comes to technology. They don't want to be at the, the bleeding edge of technology because it has to work. You know, they can't take any chances about using um, the latest technology. So, so it is a fairly conservative approach, uh, but it is proven. And the approach uh, with our technology roadmap was that we partnered with a number of those, that those were the kind of leading organizations to help us deliver our uh, technology solution. So from a HR perspective, you know, just think about the challenge. You know, we needed a system that could help us to recruit <coughs> 200,000 um, people, um, schedule, roster, uh, uniform, uh, and accredit all of those people. So having an integrated approach uh, was really important, and Atos Origin were the kind of key partner um, who helps us to deliver that. Atos Origin have been involved in the Olympics world now for a very, very long time. Um, and they've got some great, they've got some, well, they've got some great people. Uh, they've got some good systems. Um, and they, they, uh, that's, that's as much as I would say on that one. Um, but from an operational perspective, clearly at games time, technology was really, really, really important, you know, from a, uh, scoring uh, and timing perspective, you know, we had a number of world records broken. Just imagine um, if we'd got the, the timing and scoring wrong. So again, you know, that, that technology you know, has been going around the, uh, the Olympics uh, for, a, for a number of years and Omega, you know, great, great systems, uh, great people. Uh, so from an operational perspective, technology at games time was absolutely critical for us. Finally, um, what can business learn from sport and vice versa? I've tried to keep this really specific uh, to the uh, London 2012 um, perspective. So, firstly, what can business learn from sport? I think, you know, what the ODA uh, delivered in terms of all of the venues on time, absolutely, you know, no, no doubt about that. Uh, we had a absolute drop dead date for delivering the 27th of July 2012 there was no 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 doubts about that we could not slip that so you know given the sort of the previous um, uh, experience of terminal 5 which was kind of hanging around everybody's kind of you know thoughts you know is this going to be another terminal 5 that that couldn't be so I think you know what we what we were able to do and what we can demonstrate to the the business sector is you know big projects can be delivered in the UK and they can be delivered brilliantly diversity and inclusion again we've talked a lot about that this evening that was really really important for us you know we had to demonstrate again like you know my, my colleagues on the panel that our workforce absolutely mirrored um, the, the the rest of the UK particularly the East End of London the vast majority of the action was taking place in the East End um, and therefore we did a lot of work, a lot of com community outreach work uh, with the local boroughs, with the local mayors, local MPs to make sure that those opportunities really got out to, to those community groups. So we're pretty proud of the work that we did um, across that. You know, we were held to account around diversity and inclusion, around community engagement um, and we did a lot of great work there. I think working as a team with a, with a strong delivery focus was, was, was completely apparent. You know, team and delivery were, were, were key behaviours um, of low cog, and I think we delivered against that. And I think what our comms department did really well, you know, they, they had a massive challenge in terms of communicating this complex sort of sports entity to different uh, community groups. And I think, you know, there's a lot that business can learn um, from that. Uh, flipping that, on the other side, so what can sport learn from business? I think, you know, what we were able to bring, so you know, people like myself, we were able to bring a, a much more of a commercial focus to, to the sporting world. Um, and, um, you know, the experience of working in LOCOG was that there was, shit, there was amazing diversity, people from all sorts of different backgrounds, from the corporate world, education, sport, uh, the political world. All came together because they had a kind of view of wanting to deliver something brilliant and I think there's something that uh, uh, the business can learn from that in terms of bringing the best of different sectors um, together then there's the the whole kind of risk management you know what what the sport world sometimes isn't brilliant at is managing risk making sure there's the right governance in place 
uh, and then making the right um, decisions from that. And that's it. That's a little snapshot from, um, I think, the closing ceremony. If anybody was there. Thank you very much indeed, Paul, Amy, and Paul, for your thoughts and insights into, um, into your respective businesses. Um, I'd like to sort of open that up to the floor uh, with any questions, any thoughts that, that anybody has. I've certainly got a few questions myself. Does anybody, anyone out there that would like to say if, any questions? My, my main question when I heard, it was you all touched on technology and, and thinking about technology in my questions, I mean, it's a thing about LinkedIn as the main kind of, it's always being, being talked about as this like, revolutionizing uh, the way recruitment works. But, but I have yet to meet somebody being recruited by LinkedIn. I, I see technology playing a big role in the way um, advertising is being brought out and it may also play a role in the way you apply for stuff so instead of printing your email or you will upload stuff but it's still very much the old cover letter CV or is it just because I meet the wrong people or work in, <laughs> work in the wrong industry yeah. <laughs> um, I, I'd say that um, 60 to 70 percent of the recruitment that we're doing at the moment is coming as a result of LinkedIn. Um, we use what is called a LinkedIn recruiter account um, and that gives us access to people who are um, maybe more passive talent um, but the um, ability to search that database and that site um, is absolutely critical for our recruitment at the moment. Um, it's, um, you know, we, we are able to reach out to so many people um, and we get a fantastic response back. It's about how you engage with people on LinkedIn though. It's not just about sending off or, you know, shooting off random emails left, right and centre. You need to be very, very targeted with your approach and you also need to be quite intelligent with the way that you're, um, that you're trying to engage with people as well. So, Sky has its own LinkedIn page. We're constantly updating it with content. We want to make it interesting for people to look at. Um, we're very lucky because we're a content-led business, so we have a lot of things that we can put out there. But that's not to say that you couldn't in, in, a, in, a, different, um, um, in, a, in a different business. Um, but it, it's such a powerful tool, and um, it's, it is absolutely the way that we're doing, um, as I said, about 60 to 70% of our, our recruitment there. Do you? Yeah. So just to um, uh, kind of comment on that as well, um, I, I was recruited from LinkedIn in this role at Cafe Nero. So the headhunter, the headhunter who came to me um, and sought me out, found me on LinkedIn uh, through my LinkedIn profile and was looking for a particular uh, profile of somebody who'd worked in a particular type of company and culture of company in particular. So you know, Cafe Nero is a privately owned company. So they were looking for somebody with a uh, background in a privately owned business. The other thing I'd say about LinkedIn um, is you know, we do a lot of our recruitment of external senior people on LinkedIn, or at least if we see a CV or we see a covering letter, the first place I go to is LinkedIn to validate what they've said in their covering letter and in the CV and to make sure that things add up. And the final thing I'll say about LinkedIn, um, there's, a, there's a very good um, uh, business uh, program on LinkedIn, shows a history of LinkedIn. It's only been around for eight or nine years, uh, something like that. And the vision of LinkedIn is to have something like six billion people worldwide, six billion people with a LinkedIn account over the next 10 to 12 years. So a phenomenal vision to have. And if you don't tap into it now, then you're missing the boat. Any other questions from the floor? Um, all right, I'll stimulate. Oh, yes, one at the back. Um, 
Good evening. Um, uh, just briefly, uh, what, you mentioned LinkedIn. What about Twitter? Should we all be tweeting and have loads of followers and <laughs> be really funny and engaging? Or, you know, uh, does that matter a jot to you guys when you're looking to get people? Um, Twitter's an interesting one because um, there's, there's a lot of stuff on it and a lot of it's really boring and really uninteresting. Um, so again, you have to be very, very careful what it is that you're, um, you know, who you're trying to target. So for the example I gave earlier is that it's been really successful for us with, um, with specific vacancies where we know that something like our correspondents who already have a following themselves because of the fact that they're a journalist for Sky Sports News or for Sky News is able to tap into their, their sort of community. Um, we don't use Twitter a huge amount just to put random jobs out there. It's, it doesn't work. Um, so we, we tend to use LinkedIn more for that. Um, it's, um, it's, it's, it's a big, big minefield Twitter and you have to be very careful how you use it. What I would say though, um, and you know, what, what you have to be very careful of, is that what you're putting on there is available to everyone. So if you are in the situation where you are looking for a job or you are um, you know, looking to impress, then be very careful what you're writing on social networking sites. Yeah, and I, I have a, a story on that. When I, I made the cardinal mistake when I worked for Locog, I uh, got home one evening having had a few beers and uh, turned on the, the news and there was a, a particular journalist who was being very negative about the, uh, the games uh, in the run-up to the games, uh, who shall remain nameless. And, um, and, I, and he frustrated me and I... Um, and, and I knew, well, I, I'd had too many drinks at this point, but I put something on, I, I tweeted something, and it wasn't really bad, um, but, you know, he picked it up. He went straight to our head of comms and said, how appropriate is that for one of your senior managers to be tweeting this uh, about a journalist? And um, so you have to be really, really, uh, you know, I came out of that unscathed, but, you know, that was my lesson learned, a big lesson learned. Yes, go on. There's room for one. Um, I, I'm going to shout. Uh, I am interested to know how you think the balance between the opportunity itself and the employment brand has changed. Because, Amy, what you were talking about with Sky is very true, and everybody knows what Sky is all about, and therefore might apply for a job that's at the same level as where they are at another place because they're so attracted by the, the opportunity to work in an organisation like Sky. When I was younger, that was a long time ago, I, I was to look at the job specifically and think, yeah. what's the opportunity within that job title for me to progress my career? So, so I just want to ask you about how that sort of balance has evolved between the, the, the brand of your business and, and the actual job opportunity. quick go of that because um, certainly for for London 2012 the the Olympics brand was was so strong that, that people a, a lot of people made sideways moves that they were more focused on the brand than the the career opportunity as such because they wanted they wanted to be part of it they were that was so engaged with the Olympics um, and and therefore it was less about the career and much more about being part of something which was going to be incredible, and hopefully that was going to springboard them on to, to something else. Um, actually, I think one of the challenges that we have with that is that, um, so I, 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 the area that I recruit for is very content-focused, is, is content and that's really what the Sky brand is, is probably best known for. Where we actually have some quite interesting challenges and what you're talking about is um, we have a team of recruiters at Sky responsible for our corporate functions and corporate recruitment. So that would be finance, legal, HR. Um, and, you know, in, in a lot of instances, people externally, it's not about, you know, you, finance at, at Sky could be finance at, you know, at, at another company. And so with, that, with those sorts of people, we do talk a lot more about the opportunity um, and what the job is about because actually in those sorts of areas, the brand isn't necessarily something that they would think of straight away. And I'll just top that out as well and, and just say, you know, take that into the world of Cafe Nero. Um, because the branding in Cafe Nero, the employer branding, isn't that strong when you, when you look at us uh, online or offline for that matter. But what is strong is joining Cafe Nero as a way of life. So it's a lifestyle choice in many, many respects. 
and you join the company um, and we hope we recruit people who are going to be with us for some period of time. So as you step through the doorway in, in Nero, it's the uh, opportunity that you have over the next two, three, five years uh, that uh, attracts a lot of people to our company, not necessarily the branding itself. Okay. I've got a question on that. I, we, we've, we've talked about LinkedIn, we've talked about um, Twitter, uh, and we've also all three of you mentioned diversity as a key driver to uh, how you're approaching your, your talent acquisition process. How, how important is diversity now to how it was uh, not so long ago? And, and how is technology helping you achieve that? Um, we'll start with Amy. She seems to be a flavor of the month at the moment. <laughs> Um, it's, it's, it's key. It's absolutely essential. Um, it's, import, it's so important that our workforce is reflective of our customer base. Um, and there, all, you know, all the evidence um, you know, will go to show that a diverse workforce will improve your business. Um, so it, it's, it's absolutely key and so, and so important for us. Um, technology plays um, a big part in it because the globalization of the um, talent community out there um, means that you're naturally just a, a, a more diverse workforce is, is available to you. Um, there are specific um, job boards that we, um, that we use which um, target certain um, sectors of the community as well. Um, so, so, so we use that but we also run a lot of, um, we also um, attend a lot of events um, and, and networking events like this as well which will, um, you know, which will help drive up the um, and, and Paul, from LOCOG's perspective, uh, I mean, you had some really uh, sort of set criteria uh, and very challenging criteria that you had to fulfil uh, as part of your commitment uh, as, a, as a public organisation. Do you want to, can you sort of share some of those? Yeah, so, so we, we ummed and ahed about setting quotas and uh, in the end we were... Uh, forced is a, is a strong word but we had to put uh, targets in place so uh, across the six strands of diversity um, and I'll try and remember them uh, gender age uh, disability LGBT BAMI and faith um, we had a, a target uh, target zones across those six strands that we had to achieve um, by 2012 and, and the the important you know, they're all important um, but the the two most important ones really were disability um, and BAMI um, and you know so for us it was less about technology but much more about kind of getting out there working with the different community groups and really uh, using those community groups to, to really help us um, spread the uh, the message we also had a target for uh, local employment rates so uh, in the east end of London the six Host, they were known as host boroughs, so Hackney, Newham, Barking, Dagenham, Greenwich, Tower Hamlets, and Waltham Forest. Yeah. Um, so we, we had a target that 25% of our workforce had to be from those host boroughs, which you know, w w we had to deliver again. So it can be done. Um, it took a lot of work, um, but we were held to account um, by the mayor, by various... Um, MPs and other stakeholder groups so we did it because it was important and we wanted to do it but we were also held to account as well Can I have a question for uh, Paul Kennedy Paul yeah. you, when you were obviously New Balance is a, is a pretty big brand and uh, you were there for seven years I mean you know how did um, New Balance go about recruitment um, say marketing sponsorship etc Okay, I mean, New Balance um, is a very different company to where I am now. So you've you got to think about New Balance in a traditional FMCG type environment where knowledge is key. So we you know, give you an example. Um, our product um, in terms of our running shoes, uh, the people who designed our running shoes, the people who um, you know, prototyped our running shoes, the people who thought about our running shoes 18 months out, out had a very particular mindset um, that um, you know, was key for our success. And so trying to reach into um, the rich world of uh, sport and finding people who, number one, uh, you know, had a kinship with New Balance 
Um, number two, fitted within the kind of culture of New Balance. And number three, had the knowledge to help us design and develop and launch new products which were going to be quite innovative uh, and supportive of our growth plans in the future was pretty challenging. And it meant a, a big part of our recruitment philosophy was around these type of events, networking, you know, communica communicating with people on a one-on-one -on -one basis, talking to people, understanding the people who are out there who bring that type of talent to the table and that type of skill set to the table. So there's no kind of grand uh, you know, online recruitment methodologies or anything like that. It was really um, honed in um, working with people directly. I have one question. Um, how Global Sport Jobs helps you on your everyday work and how can Global Sport Jobs help students and professionals who are here? Thank you. Any, anyone? I've got the mic. <laughs> I'd say I, there's two, two answers I have to that. Um, first of all, when, you know, when I worked in, uh, in New Balance, um, uh, Global Sports Jobs was in its infancy, I think it's fair to say. Uh, and I did some work with Will in terms of launching some of the jobs that we had in New Balance onto the Global Sports Jobs website. And that's where myself and Will have been working prior to Global Sports Jobs. So I knew Will, and Will was somebody I trusted, and trust is key in terms of recruitment and in terms of resourcing. You know, having partners who are out there who help grow your brand and help attract the right people to your company is key to your success. Um, so myself and Will have worked together for you know, eight, nine years or something like that. Um, and I've watched you know, Global Sports Jobs help a new balance in terms of positioning itself as a great attractive brand uh, to, to come and join in the future. Likewise, you know, Cafe Nero, um, when I left New Balance, I had a few months off, I did some work with Will, um, came into Cafe Nero. Um, you know, we employ a lot of people in Nero from the sports environment. And myself and Will have been talking about you know, how can we get the Cafe Nero brand onto the global sports website. Because if you think about it, you know, sports people who have a passion to win, who have a passion you know, to be part of a team, who have a passion to be the best at what they're doing, are absolutely in line with what we want to have in, in Nero. So there's some great synergy between our companies and, and some great opportunities to explore in the future. Yeah, I think the only other point I would make is, uh, for, for you guys who, who are potentially looking for work is that the challenge you have is that, you know, we've kind of gone on about this all night, the, the, the kind of channels to, to find jobs now are immense, you know, and, and, and you know, this, this, is, this is one of several different approaches that you can use to find jobs and you, you have to be using them all. Um, so don't don't put your eggs in one basket. Um, don't just use LinkedIn. LinkedIn's really important, and you have to you have to have a profile on LinkedIn. You need to be looking at this job board and other job boards, um, and, and some of the other traditional methods like going through recruitment agencies, headhunters. They still have a role to play, um, but it it is a challenge when you're looking, you know, to to try and find your way through this maze. Yeah, I, I would. So I would agree with that. I think that the, the market is still defining itself uh, and I think that in certain ways it's consolidating and it, it, it's also growing at the same time. I think LinkedIn is a, is a fantastic tool. I think it has surpassed the expectations that the likes of Monster used to have um, and Stepstone and Total Jobs. I think that, that the technology and the the um, ingenuity behind LinkedIn is, is fantastic. However, you talk to some of the big sports organizations, and even some of the sports organizations, their experiences of using LinkedIn have, have been very challenging. They, they are opening their brand, they're opening up their jobs to a, a massive, massive audience, and that can be uh, quite disheartening when they don't have the infrastructure, they don't have the support, and they don't have the resources to be able to manage um, manage those responses appropriately. So there, you know, there is different channels for different jobs. There are different channels for different uh, candidates. Uh, and it's about understanding 
what the right channels are for you as an individual as you move forward, uh, as it is for clients to understand what the right channels are for them as they continue to develop and to grow their, their business. And I think, to me, that was one of, the, um, one of the key questions was that you look at Paul's sort of history at LOCOG, you went from 60 people up to 200,000 people in the space of four or five years, which is, you know, massive uh, by any stretch of the imagination, whether it's corporate or whether it's sport. You've got Sky that is, you know, I don't know how many people Sky is now, 24,000, and you've got Paul, you know, that have, has a 50% att um, attrition rate um, and looking to hire 1,800 people next year. They're, they're big numbers. Sp sport is not an industry that has traditionally big numbers associated within each of the organizations. What I'd like to understand from sort of each of you is what can the smaller organizations in sport learn from the bigger organizations that work around sport, such as Sky, um, loosely Cafe Nero, but certainly fr from the local experiences. What can the smaller organizations learn from the experiences that you have had, the three of you, as bigger organizations with bigger hiring capacities? Um, I, I, I think it's, um, it's, it's a big challenge. So certainly for organizations which are smaller and don't necessarily have the, um, have the resources for their own recruitment team, it's always going to be a challenge. I think what I would say to that is that if you are a smaller organization um, and you, you only have an, an HR department without you know, a separate recruitment function, then it's absolutely key that those HR people have, um, very, have a, a very strong understanding of the recruitment landscape and how it works. Um, and that is because um, it is really the only way in which you can control your employer brand um, by you know, constantly outsourcing any recruitment activity to a third party. Um, you're going to really dilute the messages that you want to get out to your audience. So I think that while it's, it's, it, you know, it is very difficult for smaller organizations to put the resource behind recruitment on its own, um, you would certainly need to make sure that your HR people are upskilled to be able to navigate that landscape. I mean, even global sports jobs can see that there is the, the, the transition from traditional recruitment to having internal resourcing it, you know, has shifted mon monumentally over the last sort of 12 to 18 months. Um, Paul Modley, is there anything f from your perspective that, that some of the smaller organizations should and could be doing to, to be able to accommodate sort of a small infrastructure to deliver sort of bigger um, returns? Yeah, I, I, think, um, I think there is. And, and um, one, of the, one of the lessons learned from our time at LOCOG was we didn't have huge budgets. So everybody assumed that we had a lot of money to spend. We didn't. Um, and we didn't have a huge amount of resource in terms of people. Um, so this can be done, uh, and it can be done at relatively low cost. I think the important thing is is about brand. We, we've, we've all talked about employer brands. You, you know, whether you're a big organisation, you know, we were very lucky. You know, we had the rings that we could play with, and people understood and kind of just wanted to be part of the rings. But if you're a small sport organisation that nobody understands, you've really got to work hard on your employer brand. And, and unless you get that right, then no matter how much investment you put in infrastructure and getting the right HR team on board you're not going to get the right people because people don't get it, they don't understand what, you're all, what, what you stand for. So I think you know, investing in the employer brand up front is probably one of the most important things. I, I, again, I would completely agree and I think even on, on the uh, Global Sports Jobs site, you can see that the more um, high profile brands receive infinitely better quality of candidates and it's not a question of them being better positioned on the site it's not a question of them having spent more money on the site it's just they have a much better employment brand uh, from which people respond to yeah, and I guess, you know, in, in instances like that that's where these organizations need to work with you know organizations like yourselves or recruit you know recruitment agencies so they can they can go out to market and really work work hard on, on, on that organization's behalf 
think, um, you know, while I would say that sort of, you know, we, we've got to the stage now where really 85% um, of our recruitment is done directly. It's maybe even a bit more than that, actually. So our, our use of recruitment agencies has significantly dropped. And as a result of that, we've managed to save a huge amount of money. That said, they still have a place. And um, the ones that we work with, we work really closely with. So we have a, you know, a really strong relationship with them. We really try to partner with these, uh, with these agencies so that, they, um, so that they fully understand what our business is about because it's almost impossible to explain um, you know, to somebody who doesn't know the business very well um, or, or get the right talent in. So, yeah. um, it, you know, those we do partner, those we do use, we partner with very, very closely. Yeah, just uh, to, like to ask two, two related questions. I mean, I mean, one of the great things about teaching on the programme is that we just get fantastic people. I mean, it's competitive entry, people are committed to sport, but it's University of London, so the level is high in terms of the, the intellectual capacity. Now, one of the ways in which we've tried to put those people in front of employers is through internship programmes, but, and we, we have a relationship with a few employers and actually they've gone on to recruit quite a few people. My first question is, what about the role of internships? And just, just as, an, uh, as a secondary one, we, we, over recent years we've started to have a lot of more senior people. For example, we had a criminal law barrister, for example, taking our postgraduate certificate programs. We've had quite a few lawyers who are interested. Now, now one of the things that occurred to us in the group, because we do a lot of work in sports governance is, these people would be ideal non-executive, independent non-executive directors. And it, it, it's also a way for them to actually enter the sports market. You know, it's a potential form of recruitment. I'm just curious about your views on this. Some, the, the, the internship avenue gets a bad rap, I think, sometimes. But, you know, we are, we are, we are as an organization, committed to try to grow it. And, you know, if you have time, I don't know what you think of this non-executive director angle for, for the more senior people. Um, so, in, in terms of internships, um, I think you're absolutely right. I think internships get a you know, pretty bad rap, um, particularly at the moment. Um, but they get a bad rap because some companies um, you know, use an internship as primarily to lower their cost base. Yeah, and, and that's just the wrong way of using internships. And it's, a, it's an abuse, really, of an intern uh, arrangement. And it's not fair, and it's not right. Yeah, and if you, if you um, manage an intern uh, kind of uh, portfolio in the right way, what a great way to bring talent into the organization. What a great way to nurture that talent and you know, push that talent on to achieve your growth plans in the future. Um, so in my opinion, there, there, there is a role, there's a fantastic role for the right type of internship arrangement um, in the right organizations. But there are some organizations out there which would take advantage of an internship program. And those are the organizations you, should, you just got to watch out for, do your homework on, uh, and make sure you don't go anywhere near them, quite frankly. The other side of it, in terms of non-exec directors uh, and non-executive roles, um, I think you know, non-exec uh, roles become ever more important as the companies uh, become more competitive, the landscape becomes more competitive, you want to bring in a wide, diverse group of people who are able to help you uh, and support you in terms of governance in the organization and in terms of your plans for the future, and particularly in managing risk. Uh, and that's a particular focus of, of many companies. So you know, a good blend of non-executive directors uh, and uh, advisors in the company is always uh, advisable, quite frankly. I'm a big supporter of interns, but um, and we certainly had an internship program at uh, LOCOG, um, but we made sure that it was a fair process so that, uh, you know, you still get, you know, the senior director saying, you know, I've got my niece or nephew, you know, who needs to do an internship. And, and you know, 
best will of the world, those, those situations are never going to go away. But as long as you have a, uh, the bulk of the program coming from, um, you know, uh, th there is a competitive fair process. And I think internships are a great opportunity to get young people involved uh, within an organisation. Um, but they must be paid. They must be paid fairly. Um, so it can't be a way of cutting costs um, uh, and getting good people in the organisation. Um, so I think there's, there's huge opportunities, you know, for, for big, big organisations, whether you're in the sport world or in the corporate world, to really engage with your local communities. And that was something that we did. We used the internship to engage with our communities. So we worked with the, the, the local, again, with the local boroughs to say, right, you know, we've got these internship opportunities. Help us reach out to, uh, to young people in your boroughs. And that was a great way, a great community engagement tool. Yeah, I mean, just ditto. We, we run internship programmes and they are hugely successful. Um, we, uh, they're, they're more sort what of sort of numbers, Amy, are we talking? It completely depends. Uh, lots. <laughs> I, don't know the, um, I don't know the exact figures. So, but, so for example, in Sky Sports News, um, we run a, a really, um, really great um, work experience programme which is opened up a certain number of times per year. People can apply. We go through a screening process on it. Those people come along. They really get to experience what it's like within um, Sky Sports News to work there. They shadow um, lots of the protagonists productions teams there is hugely supported by the managing editor of Sky Sports News. He is absolutely behind it and backs it and we have got so much of our talent um, who are now working within that, um, that side of the business on a full-time basis as a result of a, work experience pro uh, of a work experience placement. So they're incredibly valuable, they're, you know, they're a brilliant opportunity and um, you know, we wouldn't be without them. Any other? Um, you've talked quite a lot about LinkedIn being one of your key tools for resourcing talent, but in terms of kind of almost looking the other way for people, not just who w want to find what jobs are available at the moment, but what jobs are out there generally, yeah. because you go on a lot of companies' websites, and obviously the bigger they get, they s will kind of maybe give you a broad structure of their company and maybe a bit more information about senior managers. But in term, you know, so many com sports companies now have got so many departments with so many different roles in them. It's, it can be quite hard to actually find out what jobs are out there. Yeah, yeah, it, 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 it can be. I think it depends how it depends how you know well they're they you know they they're getting it out there. One of the good things is actually you still can use LinkedIn for that. So um, use things like the groups on LinkedIn rather than just looking for different profiles. Try and join communities that will be talking about um, opportunities that are out there. Um, I think the other thing as well when applying for jobs, you've, um, you, you, know, you have to bear in mind that a lot of um, um, organisations now will use an application form instead of um, asking you to send in a CV. So it's really important that you start, um, that you really properly fill those application forms out um, and that you, know, you, you put the thought into those as you would into, into a CV. Um, so there's, there's lots of different communities on, within, within um, a, a site like LinkedIn where you can find out more. Um, you know, if the organisation that you're um, looking to get into has got a recruitment team, then call them, <laughs> speak to them. They should, you know, help you. And, you know, I'm, I drive my guys on this all the time, is that, you know, if we don't give a good candidate experience to the people who are wanting to come and work for Sky, even if there isn't anything that's suitable for them now, um, not only could there be something suitable in the future, so we want them to have a good experience, but also they could be potential customers as well. So we have to be really, you know, we really do make sure that we, you know, try and give as much advice and support as possible to, to anybody who is interested in, in, in working for us. I appreciate that that's not always the case with a lot of organisations, but some of the online communities are quite a good way to do that. Facebook is quite good for that as well. So, and just um, on top of that as well, you know, I would echo everything Amy's just said. Um, one point I would make is, um, you know, go and research a couple of sports companies. You know, go and, go and do a little bit of homework on a couple of sports companies and then reach out to them. You know, reach out to their HR departments. Uh, go and get networked or, or use your network on LinkedIn yourself to, you know, connect up with somebody. You will find that 90% of the time, there is somebody there who would be willing to help you. 
and willing to advise you and willing to meet up with you for a coffee yeah, and just have a chat with you. Yeah, in my experience, people are always there willing to help and support you. You just have to reach out. And actually, the best people who come through to us are the people who do just that. They reach out and they want to you know, put themselves on your radar. Um, so you use it two ways. One way of actually finding out more about the company, but another way of putting yourself on the radar of that particular company. Don't be scared or shy. Because if you don't do it, somebody else will. Good point. Um, I've got a question. Sorry, are there any other, any other questions? Yes. So I think we, we were particularly successful um, at this um, in terms of uh, Paul Dighton's senior leadership team. Um, he had 12 direct reports, um, and I'm just counting through. So Gene Tomlin was the HR director, Terry Miller, the legal counsel, Debbie Jevons, the sport director, who's now gone on to be the chief exec of the Rugby World Cup um, in 2015. Um, Jackie Brock Doyle, our communications director, now gone on to uh, even more, um, you know, running a, a, an agency. Um, Sue Hunt, who was our director of strategy. So we, you know, we, we really focused on gender, and, and gender for us was one of the, the, the important um, strands. Um, and I think it helped that um, Paul Dyke and Seb Co were very focused on it. Um, and we, we did a lot uh, in terms of you know making making our message known to uh, to women outside of Lowcog. Um, so I think you you have to start at the top. You have to get your chief exec. You have to get your chairmen on board with it, um, and they have to be out there preaching the message and, and really engaging with uh, with senior women um, outside of the organisation. I personally don't, even though we had um, target zones in terms of measuring our diversity. I've never been a, a supporter of uh, quotas on shortlists for um, you know, when you're hiring, because I just I think that sends the wrong message. Um, it's about being really clear about your intent and being clear about your message, um, and you know, just continuing to focus on that. No. Does anyone else got to comment? Uh, I, I was just going to comment on that on that particular point as well. Yeah, I, I disagree with quotas as well because you don't. You know, in the real world of business, you don't manage a business by quotas. You manage a business by having the very best people you, know, you want to attract into your company, and you manage a business by nurturing those very best people um, to to facilitate your growth plans for the future. Yeah, and we, we have um, you know, many females and males right across uh, Cafe Nero who, who absolutely love what they do, absolutely you know, have a, a great career in Nero and absolutely sing the praises of the company. Um, so in that way, quotas we don't, we don't look at. We look at what's good for the company and what's good for people out there and attracting the very best people to our company. And then reversing that, actually, because there are some good role models you know, that uh, are great to be able to hold up and, and say, you know, look what this person's achieved and look what that person's achieved. So, um, and the government haven't come to us yet. <laughs> Should do that. Not yet. Not yet. Any other questions? Oh, there's one at the back. Hi, my question is from a slightly different angle. How closely are you working with sponsorship departments, or did you work at New Balance in kind of communicating the message because ideally sponsorship should help you with recruiting the right people, increasing the employee morale. Are you using the same, well not the same, but similar metrics in measuring the effectiveness of sponsorship then? Do you, do you basically utilize sponsorship in your internal comms? So very quickly in, in terms of uh, New Balance, one of the fascinating things about New Balance um, is it's now 112 years old as a company. 
and for 106 years it was not endorsed by anybody. So New Balance never paid anybody any money to wear New Balance shoes, or to wear New Balance uh, in any way, shape or form. Um, and therefore the runners, the good runners um, or the sports people who wore New Balance wore New Balance because they wore New Balance because it was good products, uh, which actually spoke more loudly than having somebody in uh, a million pound worth of sponsorship arrangements uh, and uh, that type of arrangement where we're spending a million pound and then getting shoes onto some famous personalities you know, uh, feet. That landscape has changed slightly in the last four or five years and again I go back to my earlier comment about Warrior Sports. You know, Warrior Sports is part of a New Balance brand and Warrior Sports um, is a uh, sports brand, it's a team sports brand, very big in the USA in terms of lacrosse and ice hockey. And in the USA in particular, you have to be sponsoring the big uh, teams and you have to be sponsoring individual athletes in those two particular sports and you have to be able to pay money to put your brand on you know, their backs or on their shoes or on their pads because if you don't, somebody else will. Um, so the landscape is beginning to change a little bit. Just a quick one from a London 2012 perspective. You know, I think there were a couple of our sponsors who, who did a pretty great job at using their sponsorship as a way of attracting people into their organisations. And I would pick on BP and uh, Deloitte in particular. Um, uh, Deloitte, you know, uh, were one of the early sponsors and really, really uh, milked that sponsorship for their um, graduate recruitment purposes. So when they were out going to different universities, they used that as a way of hooking um, people into their uh, into their program. Um, so I think, you know, they're, they're, from from our perspective, we're, there were some very good examples of how those organisations were using the, their sponsorship to attract people. Okay, any, um, any other questions? I know we've got some HR um, managers and senior managers in, in the room today. And I'm, what, I want to get back very quickly um, just to talk a little bit more about HR as a function. I think HR in sport has historically not been as well uh, represented uh, as it could do uh, within the leadership team. Um, and I, I think all three of you touched on the importance of, of HR within the lead, uh, and the, the importance of leadership, sorry, the importance of HR within the leadership team. Um, what, we'll start with Paul uh, Kennedy. How important is HR as a function and should it be sitting within the leadership team? Okay, two parts, uh, two answers to that uh, question. How important is HR as a function? Uh, fundamentally important uh, for the success of your business. If you go back to the model that I showed uh, in relation to you know, recruiting talent into your organisation. Primary responsibility for attracting that talent and recruiting that talent and developing that talent is a programme that your HR and, and training communities will put together. So having a first class, world class HR function is key uh, at the end of the day. And secondly, uh, in terms of leadership, how important is having you know, HR as part of your leadership team? Every part of the organization that has leadership responsibility, you should find somewhere bedded into the organization, there's a HR um, resource you know, sitting alongside that, that leader in some way, shape or form. You know, business is about people at the end of the day. Yes, it's about making money, but if you don't have the right people, you don't make the money. So it's about having the right people in the right place at the right time and having a uh, a kind of good um, HR practitioner who works alongside uh, your business folks and your business leaders is absolutely fundamental. There's a little model that's out there. If you, if you look at most organizations at a CEO level, they will have a very strong uh, group finance director who's normally sitting on the left-hand shoulder and a very strong group HR director sitting on the right-hand shoulder. And the balance of good people advice and good finance advice is key to any leader's success. Okay. Um, I, I'm 
going to speed this on. I've got a couple more questions, and I think the uh, refreshments are almost ready. So, um, technology and digital have played a major role, in my opinion, on how we are evolving the uh, talent acquisition process. Um, I'm interested to understand, and I think from Amy's perspective on this one, is what do you think the future holds? Um, if you fast forward sort of three years, what, what do you think that will look like? In your uh, presentation, you talked about data analytics, um, and you talked about the future of the CV. What do you think, and obviously in your best guesstimate, what do you think, where, where, what do you think you'll be, you know, this will be in, in three years' time? Or where it will be in three years' time? Um, I, think, uh, I think really the real growth area will come in mobile. So it will be around the um, availability of um, recruitment tools on your, on your mobile phone. I think that will be, um, that will be key. Sorry. Um, and I think it will just be the ever increasing growth of social media um, the social media landscape um, more and more and more of what we do is about in engaging with these um, with with talent um, in an interesting way so it's not just about um, you know hi I've got a job <laughs> do you want to come and do it it's um, it, you know it's about um, engaging with talent around the whole sky brand itself so I think you'll see it merging a lot more with, with um, you know, the wider business strategy, really. Makes sense. Paul, did you have a... Yeah, and I, I think, you know, technology is, is you know, it scares me how, how quickly things change, you know. Um, the, the mobile platform is absolutely going to run ahead, and, and alongside that, we're seeing lots of different apps being used to tag on to applicant tracking systems to make that engagement really fun and funky and gamification used in recruitment process. So it's really engaging, and it's not just about a flat kind of engagement and CV. It's uh, it, it, it's brought to life. So I completely agree. The the role of the CV will will disappear. Um, have, have either of you used um, video CVs? Why no, but, but again, that technology is, is, is really coming through and there's some good providers out there and uh, some organisations um, traditionally using it for, for grad recruitment um, and it works, works really well, so it can, be, it can just be kind of one way where you, 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 know, you just ask a set series of questions, or it can be two-way. Um, so I think that, that technology is, is really moving at pace. Paul Kennedy, do you, do you, are you involved in any of that? Um, yes and no. <laughs> um, so we're not involved in, in the use of video CVs yet, um, but I think that's coming. I think you have to go back to a couple of the slides that you've seen tonight, uh, which tell you a little bit of a story, really, about the trends that are happening out there in the world of recruitment and in the world of um, connecting with companies. Um, and just think back, you know, 10 years ago, there was no Facebook. 10 years ago, there was no LinkedIn. 10 years ago, there was no Twitter. They were just, you know, being talked about, you know, 10 years ago. 10 years now, look where we are. And you've got to think about where we're going to be in 10 years' time. Because the world has changed more in the last 10 years than it's changed in the last 100 years. And probably in the next 10 years, it will change more than it's changed in the last 1,000 years. So these next 10 years are going to be quite fascinating in the world of technology, and in particular in terms of social media. Yeah, no, fully agree. Right, last question, because I understand um, postgraduate students like a free drink, so... Uh, I won't hold you much longer. Um, <laughs> only orange juice. Um, it, it's been a very interesting and fascinating uh, discussion, and thank you all three of you for, for your thoughts. Um, my last question to, to each, of, each of you is, in your career, what is the best piece of advice that you have ever been given to, in helping your career, and why? Straight in there. It's a hot potato. 
Um, this is quite, quite easy for me. This is uh, our chief exec, Paul Dighton, at uh, London 2012. It was his mantra, which was not just to me, but to everybody in Lowcock, was he expected us to do the, the best work of our lives. And he said, you know, you have one opportunity to put on an amazing show, and I expect every one of you to do the best work of your lives. And, and that kind of stuck with me, you know, and I kind of, you know, he, he talked about it all the time, any opportunity, any engagement he had with, um, with low cog, uh, generally, he, he talked about doing the best work of your lives. Fantastic. Um, I think there's uh, twofold, really. The first one is, uh, is be nice. Um, people want to do business with people who are nice to do business with. Um, and so I've always tried to stick by that. And the other one is to be yourself. Um, there's just no point in, in trying um, not to be. Very wise. And uh, for me, uh, yeah, I echo those, those comments by Amy. You know, be nice. There's no question that people want to do business with nice people. Um, because you can never train somebody to be a nice person at the end of the day. You can train them to do their job, but you can't train them to be a nice person. So being nice is key to success. I go all the way back in my career to uh, my, my first job, actually, as a little sports attendant. And it was my sports teacher at school who got me that job. And it was my sports teacher who said to me, Paul, you can do it. You can do it. You can go and make a career for yourself in whatever you wanted to do. And I've never forgotten you know, those comments that my sports teacher, a guy called Malcolm Blackmore, um, gave me at that moment in time. Because I think... If you have the right mentor, the right coach, the right person who is looking out for you, who gives you some sound advice, always take it and keep on going. And I've always just taken that advice and just kept on going. I haven't stopped. <laughs> well done, Paul. Good. Um, I would like to thank the, the three panellists very much indeed for their contribution. I'd like to also hand over to Sean, who's going to uh, say a few words. Yeah, just uh, to, to thank Paul, Amy, and Paul, for coming out on a Monday night. We really, really appreciate it. So, thank you. I mean, I mean there's, there's, there's no substitute from hearing it from the, from the practitioners. I'd also like to thank Will and Global Sports Jobs. We've got an excellent relationship with you. We're looking forward to building it further. And this is just more of a private one, but thanks to my research assistant, uh, Haim Levy, although he, he, he should just be called Mr. Solutions, because he does everything. So thank you, Haim, for some... <laughs> and, um, and the last thing I'd say is that we are having a women in sport event. Um, uh, with a lot of, we have quite a few female alumni, and they're doing very well. We had, we, uh, um, it's probably going to be around May-June time. For the students from the Far East, we had an event in Seoul, uh, in, um, in September and we're going to be having a few more events going forward. The last thing I would say to you guys is, as I said at the start t hopefully tonight is, is a small step in formalising our sports management delivery group at Birkbeck and over time we would hope together that it'll be somewhere where top level employers like the people we have on the panel will go to automatically when they're looking for talent and they'll recognise the same thing that the academic staff recognise, that you're, all, you're first class, you should be working for first class organisations. Thank you very much and enjoy the evening.